Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Ed Sherman will join us in a moment. You want to talk about a great gift for the holidays? We've got it for you in a few moments here with Ed. First of all, our play-by-play call today. Speaking of the Big Ten, North Carolina takes on Ohio State last night, and Ohio State wins by 25. E.J. Little, a big performance. Here's Paul Keels. Cole Anthony takes it left point. Now goes to the foul line, loses his dribble, saves, gets in the right corner. Black rifles a three, no good. Black rebound grabbed. Andre Wesson, Ohio State, up court to Liddell, all by himself under the rim. Dunks it, E.J. Liddell. Buckeyes heads up play, looking up to their teammates. Ten for Liddell. 52-38, 52-38, Ohio State with 11:40 left in the game. Well, while Paul's in Indianapolis on uh, Saturday night, I will be in Columbus watching his basketball team play Penn State. Uh, Ohio State will be the best team that Penn State has seen so far. Conversely, Penn State will be the best team that Ohio State has seen so far. That's noon on Saturday, 11:30 will be the airtime. All right. With that, we are joined by. Truly one of the best. You want to talk about anybody uh, when it comes to media writing? Uh, it's Ed Sherman. Now when it comes to this, it's going to be a book that I think is going to be on coffee tables everywhere if you really do love the Big Ten, and many of us do. And it's Ed Sherman. The book is uh, The Official History. This is big. Ed, welcome. Great to have you with us. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see the Penn State basketball team if they're – Better than the North Carolina. They must. You guys must have quite a team this year. They're not bad. They're seven and one. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, so they're off to a good start. You know, I think, the Big, lo- I think the Big Ten is loaded oh. this year. It's going to be yeah. really a tough conference. Yeah, Penn State goes Ohio State Saturday, and then Maryland here. So the <laughs> next two, the <laughs> next two opponents. That. Yeah, the next two opponents are a combined seventeen and zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be fun in the Big Ten this year, basketball. Yeah. It will be. Okay. So when you're presented with this and you want to go through it, and I know you had some help along the way, was it a daunting task? You know, everyone's kind of asked me that, and I kind of I, – I really didn't think it was that daunting because I, I maybe in, in my head I kind of had a way – I, I, I had a uh, had an approach. Obviously, there's a ton of history, and we'd go back all the way to 1895. And I think my approach was, and maybe this is what helped me, is that I kind of wanted to write what the Big Ten was all about and what made the Big Ten the Big Ten. And it really goes back a little bit, a lot, to the addition of Penn State. Um, and when that happened in, uh, in 1990, it, there was... Jim Delaney was the new commissioner, and he had just started pretty much. He was in his first year. Didn't have that culture already, you know, ingrained in him about what the Big Ten was all about. And he threw it out there, okay, what are we going to, you know, 10, 11 schools, not the Big Ten anymore, what are we going to name the conference? And the reply was that we're not changing the name. It's still the Big Ten, even from Penn State. Penn State people said, we joined the Big Ten. We didn't join another conference. And um, and so I think that kind of – and he kind of realized that it wasn't a number. The Big Ten wasn't a number. It was a brand. It was something that represented, you know, a lot of things to a lot of people. And, uh, and you know, foremost is that it's been the premier conference in college sports since the beginning. It was the first conference. And by all, a lot of by many measurements, it still is the it is the premier conference. It's uh, and so I kind of would use that as a starting point and kind of went from there to kind of tell the story. What what's unique about the Big Ten as far as athletes and coaches and and uh, famous happenings and so many firsts you know came from the Big Ten, including being the first conference, being the first conference that did a tie-in with a, a bowl game with the Rose Bowl, the first conference that really started this whole 
realignment thing, you know, where the map has dramatically changed with the addition of Penn State. You think about what seismic shift that was like. And then also the first conference to have their own network, and people said they were crazy. And, you know, obviously the Big Ten's getting the last laugh on that one. So that's where I started and then kind of went from there. Yeah, believe me, I was there in 89 and 90 when Penn State joined. So I remember it was not actually the easiest route either for them to go because I, no. I believe, if I recall correctly, the vote was 7-3. to 7-3, three, to needed, three, right. Yeah, Steve, and, I'll give you a little history. We broke the story at the Chicago Tribune. Right. That, and, and it came so far out of left field. I mean, it was three counties out of left field. Yeah. Uh, my teammate, Skip Mislinski, came up to me and said, you're not going to believe this. One of the athletic directors, I'm not going to say who, uh, said, that, can you believe that they're going to add Penn State to the Big Ten? And I said, what are you talking about? They're adding Penn State. They're adding Penn State's joined the Big Ten. And I'm like, okay, we got to check this out. So we made some phone calls. Sure enough, we got it confirmed. And it was the led the whole newspaper was a you know it was a big story obviously for, for not just you guys for all of conference sport college sports concerning the magnitude of Penn State and um, and that was an amazing time I was there for that first game uh, I write a section in the book uh, probably about a six or seven page section about the whole backstory and Penn State joining the conference how that came about and the ramifications of that and um, that was a huge, huge. When you look at the last thirty years of um, of the Big Ten, I mean that was a huge turning point. It really changed the conference significantly. I think it was a great addition. Um, led to Nebraska. You can argue about Maryland and Rutgers. I think Maryland <laughs> obviously has a great basketball team, um, but it really changed the face of the Big Ten. That was huge. If I recall the story correctly, at least from my point of view with the people I've talked to over the years, they essentially had to convince Northwestern they weren't going to be kicked out to get, and they so they would vote yes. You know, I haven't heard that version of the story. You know, and that's you know, so that and that you know, there's obviously a lot of different stories. I knew it was hardly a slam dunk. They admit, and he talks in the book, that they could have handled it better. They kind of did this without, you know, basically said without really incorporating the athletic directors. And there was a huge outcry from the athletic directors. Bo Schembeck, oh, yeah. who was the athletic director right. at, the time at Michigan, was, was vehemently against it. And, um, and, and, uh, and, but they got, you know, they got it done. I think Stanley Eikenberry, formerly of Penn State, University yep. of Illinois presence, really wanted it. And he's, you know, I talked to him for this in the book. He's actually writes another piece in the book. You know, obviously it was very controversial at the time, but it was a huge addition to the Big Ten. And obviously it was the right move and the best move at the time. And it's just a seismic move. And here's another thing to consider. What's it been now, 20, 29 years now since they joined? Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's a whole generation of people who didn't know have don't know anything else but Penn State being in the Big Ten. I mean, it's exactly. 29 years, and exactly. it's an incredible amount of period of time and a lot of great history that they've been able to accomplish in the Big Ten. Uh, back in the early days, uh, obviously, Red Grange in the 20s has to be a part of this. Jesse Owens mm-hmm. has to be a part of this. When you when you talk about when you write about the history of the Big Ten. What do these figures not only mean to the Big Ten being the brand it is today, but what do they mean to the advancement of sports in this country to make it the obsession it is today? So here's probably, I think, my favorite stat of everything that I saw. If you remember at the end of the 20th century, ESPN did this Sports Century series where they, they, they voted the top 50 athletes of the 20th century. Five of those athletes, five of the top 33, not even five of the top 50, five of the top 33 had Big Ten connections. And let me go through this list for you. Jesse Owens, I think, was sixth. Jack Nicholas was ninth. Magic Johnson was, I think, 17th. Red Grains was in the 20s. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact figure. And Mark Spitz was 33. <laughs> so five athletes, five, and, and you talk about, these are athletes who... Endured for gener- have endured for generations. I just did 
I just went down to Champaign. They just did a symposium with the students. Uh, we had 400 kids in this from the sports business program. We did a, a symposium on Red Grange. It's almost been a hundred years since Red Grange last carried a football in Champaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, and that legacy carries on. And obviously, Red Grange was the first superstar football player in college sports, and he became in, in the twenties. He was as big as Babe Ruth and and Jack Dempsey and Bobby Jones in golf. I mean, he was an icon back then. Jesse Owens. I mean, I don't think we need to. You know, everyone knows the story of Jesse Owens. Although they don't know the big, maybe they don't know the Big Ten story of Jesse Owens. Right. Ex, you know, they talk about what he was, what he did at Berlin was great. But he, in the 1935 Big Ten track meet, yes. he set four world records, not just four world records in one day, four world records in 45 minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, I write about that, and his daughter did a contribution in the book. Another one of my great favorite stats, Jack Nicholas at Ohio State, he won the Big Ten tournament, I want to say 1961. He won it by 23 shots. <laughs> I mean, I can't even wrap my arms around 23 shots. You know, maybe, I mean, I feel like I was in the field, you know, and I think, you know, can, can you imagine 23 shots? And the great thing was that they qualified, they won the title by one shot. So they needed, <laughs> they needed all, they needed all shots. the shots. They needed, they needed is that an amazing? I mean, so I write about, you know, I write about the icons. I have a section about the icons. I have a section about with long you know i tried to do storytelling i didn't want it to be a, like a wikipedia type thing so right. there's 300 yeah. photos in the book but there's also 80,000 words of type uh, if people get the book be be warned it's a heavy book it's 352 pages and uh it weighs about five pounds i think it's a great looking book we got um, a lot of great photos that kind of also tr we wanted to try to tell the vibe of the Big Ten through some photos, and so we kind of use these photos to kind of break up the sections and talk, you know, to just really show what the fans like, the experience, what it's like to be a champion, to celebrate. We had some great – I have one of my favorite pictures is a two-page women's uh, – Penn State women's volleyball uh, winning one of their titles. Um, yeah. Where the, uh, the, the – one of the – one of the girl, one of the women in the center is jumping up, you know, like about as high as the net, you know. And the expression on her face is amazing. So, I, you know, we tried to do, you know, we tried to, we didn't get everything in the book, you know. I, it wasn't all the news that's fit to print, but I think we tried to get the feel of what this conference has been like, and you know, and I hopefully, you know, people, there's something I tried to make something for everyone. There's a Penn State four page Penn State section in the book. We do a we do a story on the great success of the Penn State wrestling program in the 2010s. So, that, again, we tried to get, as, as I say, there's something on, every, on, on your school and on every school. So hopefully people will, will, will you know, will, I'm, really want, I'm really excited for people to see this book and to kind of see the tradition of the conference and see where their school kind of contributed and fit in, in, the, in the conference. This conference is in the financial shape it is today, in part because of what Jim Delaney has done. You know, any if you're a commissioner, right. people are going to be able to take shots at you and anything you do. Right, I don't sure. care if you're Adam Silver or Jim Delaney, but there's there's a real there realism to it. You're not getting fifty four, fifty five million dollars a year unless <laughs> this guy's negotiated his brains out to get there, and he almost got Notre Dame to come in too in nineteen ninety nine. What did it mean to you that he wonder that he ended up writing the forward to the book? Well, I mean, they were this. You know, the Big Ten had, uh, published the books. You know, initially yeah, that well, wasn't going to be the case, and, and I they, understand and they, that. And they and they and they, and they, um, they they were engaged from the beginning. Initially, it was going to be someone, you know, me, myself, or someone else publishing. And then we, I think the more they got into it, the more they decided that they wanted to be the publisher, since it was going to be a book on the history of the Big Ten. Um, they were. I, I first approached them on this in 2017. And went to Jim and went to a couple of his associates, high-ranking associates, and I said, "This is this is what I want to do." There really hasn't been a book written about the Big Ten in almost thirty years. Obviously, it covers his tenure, and, and they were all in from the beginning. Not only were they all in, but I, 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 I was overwhelmed by the amount of support I got from them, and the interest, and and and. Um, and, and and just to, and, and how enthusiastic they were about the project. I just recently had a book party at the Big Ten. Us basically just thank all these people. You know, we I said we have to drink a toast to this book and to thank all these people who really 
were so vested in this project and, and really wanted to do well. And so Jim was all in. I've known Jim. I was there from day one with Jim, 1989. Yep. And we still have a relationship, and we still get to get to play golf every a couple times a year, once or twice a year, and he's a fun guy to play golf, very competitive. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of my favorite pictures in the book is that there's a cover, a 1969 sporting news cover of Rick Mount. Well, Rick Mount's on the cover, but the guy guarding him is Jim Delaney, <laughs> Jim North Delaney. Carolina. <laughs> yeah. Is that an amazing? Is that amazing? I know. That, you know, <laughs> and I said we got to run this cover in the book, and then um, we do a section on Rick Mount and, I, and uh, a story on Rick Mount, who was a great player and you know obviously probably the best shooter in Big Ten history. Oh. And we ran the cover, you know, and it's just the coincidence of that is just is stunning. One last question, because I know you have to go. One of the famous moments that opened the door for everybody to get to bowl games in the Big Ten was the 1973 Ohio State-Michigan <laughs> right. game, obviously. Before then, only the Big Ten champion went to a bowl game. How and not even handle- that. And even if there was a repeat, they didn't. They wouldn't let right. the repeat right. team go. So someone else right. had to go. Right, so they else had to go. Kids to be yeah. out of school two years in a row. Yeah, yeah, it couldn't go back to back. How how was it to tell that part of the story? Because they're still obviously the, the players are all still alive, but the coaches aren't. Yeah, I think the fun part of that, and again, to show you how the Big Ten was invested in this book, I do a section in the Ohio State Michigan rivalry, and how I think that defines the conference because it's the biggest rivalry in it from that that ten year series and really been the conference of Woody and Bo ever since, even though it's, even though these guys, went, Woody and Bo, wouldn't recognize the game now with the scores that are, you know, the, the no. last two couple, Michigan and Ohio State, they would be, no. they're definitely rolling, I did a tweet on, they're definitely rolling over in the graves. Uh, but it's still, but it's still, I mean, you watch that game and, you know, when you talk about the Big Ten, it, well, that's the conference of Woody and Bo, you know, and, and, and so, so that 1973 game for people who don't no, they finished in a 10-10 tie, so they were tied, I think, 9-0-1, both of them. And so how are you going to – who's going to the Rose Bowl? That time only one team only one team went to a bowl game, and they did a vote of the athletic directors, and Ohio State won 6-4. to four. And, 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 and Bo was just beside himself considering Ohio State had gone the year before, and he felt like they were being punished because – at late in the game, their starting quarterback Dennis Franklin uh, broke his collarbone, and they, right. I think he felt like that cost them because maybe the, the the athletic directors felt without Franklin that they would not fare well against uh, USC at the time. And so the Big Ten, you know, I said I want to write about this, and he and Mark Rudner, who's the associate commissioner, says, "Oh, we've got we still have the letters that received we received." The angry letters. And he gets me a file, you know, a huge file, you know, a foot, yeah. a foot deep of all these letters. So I kind of go through these letters, and we would print some of the letters in the book in that section. So that was kind of a way of telling that story through people being angry. And, you know, it was – it was the – you would have – I mean, people were comparing this to Watergate. I mean, you know, back in the <laughs> 70s, how this was kind of an atrocity at the level of – of Watergate and stuff, and uh, you know, the Michigan fans, were, you know, we're upset and probably rightfully so. I know we have to let you go. This book is, it, it, I think it's a must, especially during the holiday season. I'm thrilled that you're the one that got a chance to do it because I know that you tell the story right. So, Ed, thanks so much. Really appreciate thanks. your time, and Anytime, best of luck you know, with this. Please us. give me a call if you guys wanted to give it, talk about anything else, college sports. I'm always there. I appreciate that, it. Uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The outstanding Ed Sherman, author of This is Big, the official history of the Big Ten Conference, how the Big Ten set the standard in college sports. And you can order it online at BigTenBook.com. We'll come back with more in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. 
The SMC way is to offer you all applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC way. The SMC way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza Sunbury and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Final half hour of the show. Steve Jones, Sean Carey here on WKOK. It's been a great one so far with Matt Lombardo and Steve with some great pro football talk and also a terrific conversation with Steve and Ed Sherman, author of the new book, This Is Big, Complete History of the Big Ten Conference. Go to BigTenBook.com. Get your copy uh, copy, uh, in time for the holidays. So a little bit to go here on the show uh, before 5, and then we'll have our late-day news roundup 6.05. Steve will be back with us here on WKOK. Uh, we'll also have tonight NFL action for you. Uh, tonight, uh, I got the Dallas Cowboys and the Chicago Bears. And that'll be the Westwood One nationwide coverage starting at 8. We'll get a lot of college football talk going tomorrow afternoon yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, Brad Edwards from ESPN Radio College yes, Game sir. Day will be with us tomorrow. Yes, sir. And the picks. And the picks tomorrow. And then our bowl picks in the next week. The. Uh company holiday party is tonight yes i hope all of you have a good time some of us will be working that's right all right so (laughs) i will send your best to everybody there just so the company realizes like i do a show every thursday night okay thank you Uh, uh, okay we're done (laughs) from this month to that month (laughs) yeah Every year. Uh, For how many years now? Oh, I don't know. Well, how many years have I done the show? 20 years. Yeah. 20 years. Every Thursday, 20 years. So just in case for planning purposes, like next year, Thursday, I am probably have a show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> as, I always, as I always tell people, like, for example, somebody who's in a, you and I both know the soup plan this out. Uh, just for planning purposes, as I, I always have an old saying, make your own mistakes. All right, so uh, <laughs> Penn State basketball did win last night. Uh, they put the basketball and football schedules out early, too, so you kind of know where I am. Uh, so, uh, But they played last night, and uh, Penn State won by 22. With that, we bring in uh, Ben Jones, com. Ben, welcome. Great to have you with us. Hey, Steve, thanks for having me. So last night, I uh, had a chance to watch them. Ben, in person, what stuck out to you about the Penn State team of 1920? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think, you know, when you look at this Penn State basketball team, I think one of the most impressive things about them right now is they can be not good at something on one night and still find a way to win. I think, you know, you go back and look at the box score, they only made five threes. I think they attempted 28, but they scored, right. you know, nearly 50 points in the paint. They've been able to get scoring from all over their roster, all over the floor. Um, it's just impressive. You know, you can say whatever you want about Wake Forest. You can say whatever you want about the iteration of Syracuse that they've got going on this year. The Penn State is playing power five teams and pretty much handling them with relative ease and i think you know every time they do that you go wow this 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 team appears to be uh very much for real so let's get to mike watkins uh mike did not have a big scoring night he didn't take many shots i think he took six the entire night but the rebounding and the block shots what is his presence like out there yeah i mean i think mike is a guy that 
you know, him just being on the floor impacts you on both ends. Um, even if he doesn't touch the ball on the defensive end, you know, offensive players have to keep him in mind because he has such a good first hop and such a good second hop. Um, uh, offensively, I think he's really blossomed this year into a, a, not a more confident player, but a more confident and consistent player in a way that has really allowed him to produce. And, you know, his athleticism speaks for itself and what he's able to do on the glass. Um, you know, he is a guy with the right kind of minutes and the right kind of situations that could give you practically you know 15 and 20 it feels like on any given night obviously there's no way that that average works out that way but I, I think ultimately you know the confidence that he is playing with right now you're seeing I think the closest thing we've seen to a fully realized Mike Watkins in his career and I thought it was impressive last night when he got to his 800 rebound career rebound uh, you know practically you, you think of all of the games that he has missed or not played because of foul trouble early in his career the fact that he's able to get to that mark um, you know, with all the obstacles that he's overcome kind of is a testament to his work on the glass because when Mike is on, you know, it is difficult to rank any position in the Big Ten, but I, I would argue that Mike Watkins is certainly as good as any big man in the in the league right now, if not um, better, and he is certainly playing like it so far this season. He's got something like, I don't know, 45, 46 rebounds in the last three games, which is remarkable. Jamari Wheeler, uh, we all know what the limitations to his game happen to be. How important has it been, though, that Jamari Wheeler has been the one that also realizes the limitations to his game and accentuates his strengths? Yeah, I mean, I think you looked last season at probably the last five or six games or so of the year. Jamari Wheeler seemed to have kind of figured out, uh, you know, what he was good at and what he not wasn't good at, but what his strengths weren't. And I think you go into this season, um, you know, he is tenacious on defense. He is confident with the ball. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think we've seen Jamari take very many bad shots. And I think he right. realizes the sort of offensive capabilities that he has. Um, but, you know, you talk to Pat, and one of the things that he says is, you know, people talk a lot about what Jamari can't do, um, but there are a lot of things that he can do. And I think, you know, he has been good finishing around the rim when he's had those opportunities. Um, you know, I think he ran the same kind of offhanded, you know, finger roll off the glass a couple games ago. It was four or five times in a row that really worked well for him. But he is he's very much a good example of a guy that knows what he's good at, is good at, is very good at it, and the things that he is not as good at, he isn't trying uh, to impose his will on. And I think ultimately one of the things that this team has done a good job top to bottom is it seems that everyone really understands – you know what their role is what they're good at and what they're supposed to do and jamar is just you know one of the examples of a guy that's embraced his role and hasn't tried to expand it beyond that now let's get to myron jones uh i don't know what pat talked uh, to the media about after the game i know what he talked to with dick and me after the game uh on wednesday night and he said to us he said look he said this guy changed up and became the first guy in the in the weight room this guy changed up became the first guy in film and myron told us after the game that he thought it was a critical that he make those changes if he wanted to make himself the kind of player he wants to be what are the results of what we're seeing from myron jones right now yeah i mean you looked at how he played in sort of off and on minutes last season and i think one of the things that stuck out to me at least was he played him very confident. You can have guys that'll come in and maybe play five or six minutes in this sort of foul trouble reserve role, and he went out and played like a guy that, you know, expected to contribute. I think you look at how he has played this year. Obviously, his shot from outside has been fantastic, um, you know, especially on the nights when Penn State needed someone to score. He's playing with a lot of confidence, and I think, you know, he answered the question when, when Razier Bolton left the program. I think there was sort of a question mark there about where were they going to get some of that younger, non-Miles Dread scoring. Um, and I think Myron has stepped up in a lot of ways, probably more consistently than Miles has, at least early in the year. Um, so I, I think, you know, he is a, he's a good example of, uh, you know, what a little bit of work in the weight room, what can do, what a little bit of confidence can do. And I think, you know, we look back over the years that, of players that Pat Chambers has had, um, you know, Brandon Taylor is sort of the quintessential example of a guy that developed over his time at Penn State. And it seems like MJ is another guy that is quickly kind of growing into what he can be. And I, I think, you know, you expected him to have a better year in a bigger role this season, but I don't think I expected him to be as good as as consistent right off the bat. And that's a testament to a lot of different people. And it's also translated. You have to earn your own opportunity. 
But, you know, but when you get your opportunity, take advantage of it. This year, Myron Jones is that opportunity. And I think, you know, I think that's a big part for him. I think for him starting, I think it's one, it was a big deal to him to start, Ben. I, I don't know how much you've talked to him, but I think it's a big deal that, that he ended up, quote, being a starter. Yeah, I mean, that stuff is huge, especially when you look at, you know, the, the, the talent that Penn State's got. We were talking about this in the press area last night that, you know, there's an argument to be made that some of these guys that are coming off the bench for Penn State, especially if you look at Isaiah Brockington, that are, yeah you know, arguably the second best athlete on a team five or six years ago, or it's not the best guy. And I think, you know, you look at the depth this team has, the interchangeable parts that this team has, the fact that, that Myron's been able to earn himself a starting spot. You know, this is not something that was given to him because there are a lot of guys that right. got on this team, especially guards, um, that, you know, just as easily could have taken that from him. So let's get to Miles Dredd. You talked about overcoming something. Now, some of those three-point shots, by the way, when you're talking about the five or 28, well, probably 10 of them were late in the game. Uh, but still, it's not the number you want to see. You want to see a team shooting 35 to 40%. That means Miles Dredd. He's in a shooting slump right now. What could it mean to them if he hits a couple and then breaks out of it? Yeah, I mean, I think you any shooter, you know, that sees the ball go through the hoop, sometimes that's all they need. I think, you know, Shep Garner is probably a really good example of a guy throughout the course of his career that would have cold streaks. And then when he was hot, um, you know, good luck because Shep is going to drop 25 on you in the course of the right. next 15 minutes. So I, I think, right. you know, Miles Dredd is probably a slightly more diversified scorer than Shep was, but I think, um, you know, there's no doubt he struggled a little bit in New York. He struggled last night, but I think when you when you know what he can do, it's just a matter of getting out of the rut. And I think the fact that Penn State can still, you know, go out and win these games, you know, despite having one of their best shooters being cold is a testament to the guys he's got around him. So I think if anything, you know, maybe something that helps him a little bit more than it helped Shep is, you know, he doesn't have to make these shots for Penn State to win. Certainly, right. it's going to help. Certainly, they're going to need him to make shots against Ohio State, Maryland, and a lot of those Big Ten teams. Um, but, you know, he's got sort of an alleviated pressure a little bit because there's so much help around him. Uh, you mentioned Isaiah Brockington in a previous answer. I thought last night was a really important game for him after how everything played out for him in Brooklyn. Moving forward now, when you look at Brockington, what does he bring to the table that's a little bit different than everybody else? Yeah, I was telling somebody last night that he reminds me a little bit of what would happen if you rewired Josh Reeves to be an offensively inclined player in terms of the athleticism and aggressiveness and everything. Obviously, Isaiah has been really good on the defensive end, but he just has an athleticism and a, and a motor and something about his first step, something about just his explosion that is, is different from everybody else on that team. And they've got a lot of really good athletes. I think, you know, he has continued to knock off the rust of not really playing. You can practice with a team, but it's not the same thing as game speed. I think you've seen for the most part you know he's had his ups and downs but i think games like last night you kind of realize what he brings to the table um you know so i think if he continues to play with that confidence continues to kind of you know play with a fearlessness that was really that was what made josh reeves so good and i don't think penn state's necessarily trying to replace josh reeves with one player but i think if you look at brockington's athleticism and his disruptiveness uh and really how he's growing into his own on the offensive end you've got a guy that's you know, really contributing on both ends of the court. And I think in a lot of ways, you look at this Penn State team and the thing that's made them so good is, you know, they have varying degrees of offensive prowess and varying degrees of defensive uh, abilities. But I think for the most part, all of these guys have something to contribute on both ends of the floor that is a net positive for Penn State. And, you know, ultimately, you know, there are a lot of teams in America that would like that problem. And I think Brockington, um, is just another piece of that puzzle of a guy that's pretty much finding his way uh, well on both ends of the floor. Well, they've gone through a stretch where they've had Georgetown, which, oh, by the way, won last night at Oklahoma State, 81-74. Ole Miss, Syracuse, Wake Forest. Now they've got Ohio State, home with Maryland Tuesday, home with Alabama Saturday. So now to Ohio State. There is one common thread in all eight Ohio State wins this season. Nobody has shot over 40% against them. How much better is the Ohio State team we're seeing right now compared to the one we saw last year? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they – it's sort of funny. I think Penn State's in the process of playing every Ohio State athletic program as it is hitting a peak of, of goodness. Um, <laughs> you know, Penn State's not going to get any easy outs against Ohio State on the entire athletic calendar. But, yeah, I mean, they've always been a good offensive-minded team. They've always been pretty good defensively. I think they're just getting better. You know, if, if Penn State can draw any confidence going into this game aside from how it's playing and aside from, you know, just their own confidence. Because Penn State, for whatever reason, has played Ohio State close the past couple of years. I think, uh, you know, Pat has probably got more Big Ten wins against uh, Ohio State than not anybody yeah. else. But certainly it's in, it's in that category of, you know, you're surprised to see that when you tally them all up. Um, so, you know, I would expect Penn State to go in there and give them a fight. I think they're playing well. Uh, but Ohio State is really good on both ends of the floor. Um, they're playing at home. There's a lot of obstacles there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they are they are better than they were last year, and that's saying something. Um, but you know, again, you know, Pat said a couple of days ago that certainly, you know, you've got to say, hey, we're preparing for Ohio State. But Ohio State's got to say, uh, you know, hey, we're preparing for Penn State, and for the first time in a while, you know, that really might be true. Well, in fact, that's that's how I was going to open the game on Saturday. There is no question Ohio State is the best team Penn State has played so far. Conversely, there is no doubt that Penn State is the best team Ohio State has played so far. So that's what's going to make Saturday intriguing. Ben, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Yep, thanks for having me, Steve. Ben Jones, statecollege.com. We'll wrap it up in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. Uh, the company holiday party is uh, on tap for tonight. Sands one unimportant individual. All right, so uh, great to have you with us. <laughs> we'll circle the room and give you a um, accurate as possible progress report uh, for tomorrow's show. There really is no need to. I can already guess. Okay. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we will keep tabs on Southern Columbia football. Had a big pep rally this afternoon. Uh, they'll have their game tomorrow afternoon with a 1 p.m. kick at Hershey Park Stadium. So we'll check on that as well as we get the show rolling tomorrow afternoon here. From Columbus tomorrow. Yes. I'll be flying to uh, Columbus uh, tomorrow around noon, and we'll do the show tomorrow from 3 to 5 in Columbus. What a thrill. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to go. Can't wait to see it. It's not like I was just there. Oh, wait, it was. <laughs> it's, it's that was so time. just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so a couple weeks ago. Uh, my goodness. Um, and Penn State will play Ohio State Saturday at noon. Tomorrow night, by the way, it's Utah and Oregon. Uh, we'll talk with Brad Edwards of ESPN about that tomorrow. And uh, the king is on tomorrow, our picks. Uh, are we back to a tie now? I believe it's either tied or you took the lead by one game. Okay. Yes. And, and tonight is Dallas and Chicago. Yeah. I mean, can you ask for two more dynamic teams than that? <laughs> Well, two storied franchises in the National Football League. We'll, we'll try to give this as, as oh, best of a positive yeah. spin as we can. <laughs> it's, like, it's like calling the Polo Grounds historic. All right, so <laughs> great. So, which there's team? Apartment, there's apartment buildings on the ground on the Polo Grounds right now. <laughs> which team is going to strike on fire on offense tonight? But just but Dallas is just so up and down. I mean, when it comes to that spotlight. And getting the win when you need the win, just Dallas hasn't delivered. I mean, look what happened in New England. Look what happened last Thursday uh, with a you know very much improved Buffalo Bills team. I think a lot of people were thinking, well, you know, it's not how you start; it's now it's how you finish. And you know, Buffalo's been off to a great start, and uh, and they're getting more consistent play. Their quarterback's playing better. Their defense is terrific, and they're buying. And now the coach is into his third year running the show up there. The fighting so, Terry the- Pagulas. Oh, yeah, the Bills, yeah. yeah As for the yeah. Bears, the best offensive play they ever run where it was, like, the best executed, they did a kneel down at the end of the first half to get to the locker room. I don't think you can do it any better than that. 
It's just been such a turnaround from the Bears after being in the playoffs last year. What was there? Were they was it twelve and four, thirteen and three? Yeah. Last year. Right. Wow. I don't think Matt Nagy saw it coming either. Yeah. <laughs> they are not good. <laughs> and yet they have the same record as the Cowboys. They're both six and six. I think the burning question is with the NFC East. This could have been one to give Matt Lombardo. Is it going to be? Is it, is it going to take eight and eight or seven and nine to win the division? Wow. Meanwhile, the Steelers have some guy named Duck at quarterback. On to Arizona, and they're in the they're, they're the they're the they're the playoff kings right now. They they're in the sixth spot. Tomlin, coach of the year. He has done a great job. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app.